So I've got something I want to share with you, and you can just go to the book of Luke, if you would, and just kind of hold your place there. I'll keep you in suspense as to where we're going. The book of Luke, chapter number 24, and like a lot of other preachers, I say, if I were going to title this, I always wondered why they didn't just title it. I would title this Power from on High. Not too long ago, and before I begin, let me say, we are, everybody listen and say amen, we are a Pentecostal church. Wouldn't hurt for you to put your hands together. Wouldn't hurt for you to lift a hand and shout amen. Pentecostal. Is that right? That's an experience. And we're a Pentecostal church where I pray to God that you and your children and your grandchildren will grow up and they'll have a place where they can come and not hear about God, but they can experience God for themselves. Everybody shout Pentecostal. Come on, say it again, Pentecostal. Now, in, in some ways, that, that term has become a bad thing in today's time. Even Pentecostal churches have gone away from the Pentecostal experience and the doctrine of the Bible that takes us to that place. Not too long ago, I'm at a restaurant. And I was eating by myself. And I know some of you are like, oh, I wanted to be alone. And I'm eating at that restaurant and I'm sitting close to the window and this has happened several times, but and I was watching people as they would pass by. I could see the parking lot. I could see the cars that would pull up by the street. I could see people, see people coming and going, and some would come inside and sit down. And I remember I watched this one car. I'm enjoying my lunch, and I see this elderly couple pull up. And they pull into the parking lot, and, and slowly they started to get out of their car. Everybody say, slowly. Slowly. I'm moving slower today than I was yesterday. But they pull in and they slowly begin to get out. I see movement. I see the man. As he climbs his way out of the car and it looked like he was holding on to the door and everything else for support. He makes his way around the side of the car and it takes him like about an hour he goes all the way to the passenger door and he opens it up to let his wife out. So that intrigued me. So I keep watching and they're standing there moving slow and, and I'm thinking that she's about to emerge out of the car but then he leaves her sitting there and starts to go back towards the trunk. He messes with his keys and finally opens up the trunk of that old car and he begins to get the wheelchair out. And you could tell that it was just about all that he had to get that wheelchair out of the trunk of that car. He sets it out, he fumbles with it, he does his best, he gets it set up and he starts wheeling it to the, to the door and he reaches down and he grabs his bride. And he picks her up out of that car and helps position her so that she can sit down in that wheelchair. And in what seemed like an hour, I watched that man take care of his bride. And I watched them both as they struggled. I'm going to say struggled. They're struggling. But the journey wasn't over yet because after all of that effort, they had to be tired. You could see it on their face. But then he starts to roll that wheeling wheelchair through a gravel parking lot. And he's behind her and he's pushing. And the whole entire time that he's pushing, she's talking. 
And I don't think he heard a word she said. She's just talking and she's pointing and he's looking down at the gravel, probably thinking, what in the world am I doing? I've got to get her across this parking lot. I watch them and it seems like with every ounce of strength, they're putting everything they have and they finally get close enough to the door where I can see their face and, and I saw what looked like pain. Maybe some discouragement. Maybe there was some sadness and yet there was some excitement. They could see the door of the restaurant. They were excited that they had made it through all the struggles and all the trials and all the effort and all the work. And somebody went and opened the door and he wheeled her in. And I remember thinking to myself, what a monumental effort to get a cheeseburger and fries. But it's what they wanted. They had a desire to go through everything that they had to endure to get out from their comfortable place at home, out of the recliner, and to make their way to that restaurant so they could have what they wanted. Is anybody hear what I'm saying? They got close to that. They walked into the door. They came in. They sat down. They ordered their meal. And I'll never forget and I give great big props to that man for taking care of his wife. Uh, looking on that, I remember thinking to myself that day and often afterwards that they reminded me, their effort reminded me of many believers, many Christians who are doing their very best and they're making every effort and they're trying as hard as they can to complete this journey and to do what God has called them to do. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm still striving. You're not in a perfect church. There are people here today who have struggles who have made mistakes, who have regrets, who still to this very day have to make a monumental effort just to carry on. Men and women, moms and dads, grandparents, teenage boys, teenage girls, the rich and the poor, young adults and elderly individuals who are striving towards the goal of godly living making every effort to be faithful to the call. You ever felt a call in your heart? Mm. And they're trying their very best to be what God has called them to be. But there's just so much stuff. Like the man struggled himself to get out of the car. There's people here today that struggle to get out of bed. Like he had to unpack the wheelchair that was almost too heavy for him to carry. There's people in this church who have heavy burdens that they lug around with them everywhere. Take them to Walmart. Take them to your grandchildren's birthday party. Take them to church with you and they, they're right there and they're such a burden and they're so heavy and it's almost as though you're not able to carry it anymore. And for some, living the Christian life or doing what God's called them to do or walking in the victory that Jesus has already provided, listen, for some, it's a monumental effort that many times ends in failure. Can I get a witness? I see it sometimes in your eyes when you come to church. I hear it when you cry out to God in anguish. I read, I, I read it when I read your text messages. For some, the journey is almost too much. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, this morning I believe God has given us a solution. 
I believe it with all of my heart. He has placed it in the Bible. He has prescribed this remedy a long time ago and the church used to understand it and we used to walk in it, but now it's like we've forgotten the answer. That's another sign of getting old. I walk into the kitchen and she said, and Michelle says, what are you doing? I don't know. I forgot why I came in here. It's all right if you laugh because you do it too. And it's like the church has forgotten this answer. So we're going to look at that today. We're, some are going to learn. Some are going to be reminded. But, but if your journey is filled with failures and if you've grown weary in the race, let me tell you, there is an answer. And the answer is here today. But sometimes you've got to get tired of being sick and tired. So go with me to Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. And before we read there, let me try to set the stage. We're about to read about the disciples. Men that Jesus had called, they didn't do anything to deserve it, but he said, come and follow me. And they had been given a mission. Now, these were just normal men, nobody special. They had lived with and walked with Jesus for over three years. They had heard him speak. They had heard him teach. And they had seen miracles with their own eyes. Come on, somebody. And then suddenly... Jesus, their master, had been taken away from them in the garden at nighttime. Betrayed by one of their own, Jesus was taken to the whipping post. And how many of you heard about that? And they scourged him. Then they forced him to carry his own cross. And then he was crucified on a hill called Golgotha. And I mean, imagine how horrible that must have been. And on a side note, it's not a side note, but on a side note, I want you to understand he did that for you and for me. He did that for the forgiveness of sins. He did that for our salvation. His blood was shed at the cross so that you and I could be saved. But you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what's going on in my life. But I know that 2,000 years ago, there was, a, there was a Savior hanging on a cross and he shed his innocent blood, sinless, spotless blood that he shed so that you and I could be saved. Mm. But imagine how they felt. The pain, the shock, and the dismay that the disciples must have been feeling. Jesus, their master, the Son of God, had been put to death. What about all of his teachings? What about life and life more abundant? What about the mission to save the world? How could they continue on and do what Jesus told them to do? I mean, they were regular people. Had a guest come one, one time, and their best compliment, number one, was that I felt the Holy Ghost when I walked in the door. And number two is that your church is filled with normal people. Anybody here normal say amen? amen. Some of y'all are lying. <laughs> they were regular people. They had struggles of their own. They had doubts. We see that in Scripture. The enemy hated them, and the world was against them. How would they carry on? They had been promised victory and power and success, but now Jesus had been put to death. Well, the Bible says that, yes, Jesus did lay down his life, but you hear me, he took his life back up again. And on the third day, the Bible said Jesus rose from the grave. Anybody thankful for the resurrection? Shout amen. amen. And here in this chapter, we find Jesus with his disciples, and this is part of their conversation. Go with me to, I think it's the 44th verse. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. 
which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Listen to this part. Then opened he their understanding. Oh, that God would open our understanding. Supernaturally, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So there's a mission to accomplish. And ye are witnesses of these things. So catch this, you've been a witness to these things. I've promised you a life of victory, not defeat. I've given you a mission to accomplish. There are things for you to do, and there's a life on earth here to prepare you. But before you do that, there's something else you've got to do. Come on, somebody. And he tells them in the 49th verse, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Come on, somebody. Wake up. He said, I'm going to send you the promise of my Father. You're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to wait until you are endued or filled with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and he, and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Mm. Now, can you imagine how the disciples must have felt? After losing Jesus and then seeing Jesus after all that had happened. You see, Jesus would be gone at the end of that chapter. And the Bible said he would ascend into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God. Come on, somebody. But the disciples, they still had a life to live, a journey to complete. They had a job to do. They still had struggles. They still faced impossibilities. The world still hated them. But how would they do that? Like all of us, how many of you can say, man, we have struggles, problems? Anybody got any problems? Just wave your hand. Don't throw them up here. Just... Real life situations, things going on in your family, come on somebody. Those disciples, they still had a past, they still had regrets. The world hated them and so much so that they tried to kill Jesus and the enemy, listen, would be out to get them. 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you know the world hates us? Do you know the enemy is lurking even in this church today trying to find somebody that he can devour? And Jesus just up and leaves. And there they are wondering what they're going to do. But it was in this text that Jesus gives them important instruction, which I feel like today the Pentecostal church is falling short. So important that it's in this chapter, I find it to be some of the last things he ever said to them. And he said, I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. Everybody shout that, the promise of the Father. Say it. I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. So wait until you receive power from on high. Come on. In other words, you've got a promise of victory. Anybody believe that? Shout amen. You've got a mission to accomplish. 
things will get hard and you might get tired, but here is my prescription. Go and wait in Jerusalem and I will send you the promise of the Father and give you power from on high. I'm going to give you power to live this life. Wouldn't that be something? I'm going to give you power to accomplish your mission. Many times when God lays his hand upon somebody's life, an adult or even a teenager or even a child, they feel as though they're helpless to bring that to pass. There's no way I could ever do that. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and I'll fix that. I'll give you power not only to live in victory, not only to walk in success, but I'll give you power to finish this race and to accomplish your mission. Are you hearing me? This morning, like that elderly couple I saw, there's too many Christians today who are barely making it. People sitting, I've been one of them. Anybody else ever barely made it? Say amen. Just so that everybody knows we're not alone. I mean, I've been there where I was barely making it, barely. And I remember stopping at one point saying, God, this is not how you want me to live my life. This is not what you planned for me. No. He said, I know you. I know your heart. I've got a plan for you. And it's to give you an expected end. So I, I see people who are failing in their best efforts. I'm going to know the devil will use that too. Listen, failing in your best efforts. Trying so hard. I'm trying. I, I'm doing everything I know how to do. I'm trying so hard. And you end in failure. Then condemnation begins to come upon you. Understand this. The Holy Ghost never does condemn you. He will convict you to the right path that we're to go down. Is that right? But I see people who's not doing what God's called them to do because their burden is too heavy. They're tired, they're weak, they're beat up, they're condemned. But like Jesus told the disciples, he told them what to do. I came this morning to tell you and to remind some of you that Jesus didn't save you and then leave you by yourself. But he is going to send the promise of the Father. He's going to send the promise of the Father. Anybody hearing that say amen? So what was the promise of the Father? Simply said, the Holy Ghost. Come on somebody. Say that with me, the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in John 14 and 16, Jesus speaking, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Come on, somebody. So I'm going to go, but I'm going to ask God the Father to send you another comforter. And we know that. That word comforter translated paraclete, which means one called alongside to help you. Ha. He said, I'm going to send you another helper so that God can abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Anybody know the Holy Ghost? Say amen. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Hmm. John 16 and 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the helper, will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. Jesus died, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, but he didn't leave his children here alone. He sent the Holy Spirit to the believer. The promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost, to be our comforter, our helper, and to fill us with his power. Acts 1 and 8 says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And then the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 
You can turn there. It's a few verses. Most of us know it. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The disciples did what Jesus told them to do. Is that right? And Jesus did what he said he would do. They went, they waited, the Holy Ghost was given to the church on the day of Pentecost. And what happened? The disciples who had been hiding in the shadows, struggling in defeat, who were brought, who were, who were taken away and, and they were scared to death. Those that were hiding in darkness, they were brought into the light. They had been weak in their fears, but now they were standing strong in their faith. And they walked in victory. And they had the power to be a witness. And God blessed them in more ways than we could ever dream. Why? Because God sent the Holy Ghost to be their helper. Go back and read the book of Acts and see what happens. God took a bunch of regular men who had their own issues and a job that they could never do. And he gave them power to live a godly life, to overcome temptation, to walk in the spirit, to walk in victory, to cast devils out, to heal sick bodies, and do amazing things for the kingdom. Let me ask you, how many of you here today would like the power to overcome sin? Well, a few of you. How many of you would like the power to walk in victory? How many of you would like to do great things for God? Now, the problem is that we say amen, but we're doing nothing to put ourselves in that position. You want to do. Hmm? I want to do. But your burdens, they're just too heavy. You're like that elderly couple, and you're barely making it from day to day or from Wednesday to Sunday, constantly failing. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Shout amen. Amen. Constantly falling short and feeling helpless, never doing what God called you to do. And you hear me, church, I know that feeling. Anybody else know that feeling? Say amen. Amen. I I know failure. I know what it's like to be condemned. But I'm here to tell you that there is power that's available to us. And it's the power of the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you, that's exactly what we need today. And I say this a lot. But I'm going to tell you right now in this year, it's not a new leader for either political party that we need the most. No, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to once again burn in the heart of the church so that God can do great and mighty things. If we don't have that power, if we don't have the Holy Ghost, you hear me, we're facing an impossibility. Right now, some, somebody's sitting there and you've got this situation. Without the Holy Ghost, it's impossible. But oh, when we have the power, let me tell you, God will do great and mighty things. But sadly, listen, this is something the, the modern day church has forgotten. The early church and the church for many years, they knew they needed the power. Not just a good service. Not just, you know, lights and smoke and the latest songs. They knew they needed the power. That's why many of the greatest revivals were born out of a, out of a, a, a basement with cinder block walls and people got down to praying and they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? They knew they needed the power. And yet the, we see it in, the, it's evident in their history. We see, we see that God moved. He, they witnessed miracles. They, went, they were a witness. But now things have changed. And there's opposition to the Pentecostal experience. We've even 
coined a new term instead of saying the Holy Ghost, we, we say the Holy Spirit, which I don't think there's anything wrong with either term, but it's the reason we change the term. Because we're ashamed or we're fearful or what might, somebody might think. Come on, somebody. It's so more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Acceptable. Politically correct. To refer to him as the Holy Spirit. Listen, he is the Holy Spirit. And he is the Holy Ghost. And he is the third person of the Godhead. And he deserves all of our honor and all of our... Is anybody hearing this? We need the power. But the church today has so forgotten and so belittled and have so dismissed the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? We're seeing the evidence. People think my power is good enough. How's that working out for you? Or the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost will run people off. Will he? Oh, well, I'm not worthy, but didn't Jesus make you worthy? We need the power. Now, going back to what Jesus said, number one, the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. And the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, if God made a promise, how many of you know he will keep his promise? And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is the promise of the Father that God would send the Holy Ghost to fill the believer and to give them power. So let me tell you today, if you're, I, I don't know how many times over the years I've prayed with people in the altar to receive the Holy Ghost and they would say, but I'm just not worthy. If you are saved, listen, then you should be filled with the Holy Ghost. Is that right? Come on, somebody. I mean, that's like going out to buy a brand new car, but you don't have tires. What good is that car going to do you in the driveway when they drop it off, at, when the tow truck drops it off? You're not going to be able to go anywhere. But you know, when we, when we come to Christ, it's like we get saved and then that's it. Let me tell you again, if you're saved, anybody here today saved, shout amen, amen. then you should be filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm. Well, I'm not religious enough. Or, well, that's kind of scary. Or, I, I'm, I'm doing okay right now. You hear me? That's a lie. As a believer, Jesus went to the cross of Calvary to make us worthy, period. I'm not striving to be worthy. I've been made worthy. Come on, son. And when your faith is in the finished work of Christ at the cross, then you can begin to understand that you are worthy, that Jesus paid the price. He finished the work. Jesus made you worthy. First Peter chapter number one, verse number 18, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold or religion or by obeying the rules from your vain conversation, but with the precious blood of of the lamb as a lamb without spot or blemish you have been made worthy he shed his blood he gave his life to make us worthy you're not striving to be worthy you should not you shouldn't strive to be worthy he made you worthy you are saved if you've put your faith in the finished work of Christ, you are saved. And the gift of the Holy Ghost is for you, the believer. Somebody say amen. You see, the cross made you worthy when you put your faith in that. And it was the cross that paved the way for the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I've got to go. 
I mean, he had to catch an Uber. He was going to the cross. And I got to go because if I don't go to the cross, the comforter will not come. But if I go and pay the price, if I go and make you worthy, if I go and shed my blood and give my life, then the Holy Ghost will come and he will be your helper. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit is the promise of God to every believer. So much so that the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number one, Listen to these two scriptures. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Come on, son. Say, I've been sealed. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You see, God gives the Holy Ghost to the believer not only for power over sin or to be a witness, but the Holy Ghost is our seal. And he is our deposit that God has placed in us until we come to the knowledge of our inheritance, which is in heaven. Somebody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. So when we're saved, we are sealed with the Holy Ghost. And when sealed, we then should be filled. Come on. Not because we're worthy huh? or because we've earned it, but simply because we received him by faith. The same way we believe in faith to salvation. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? It's the same way we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it is the plan, listen to me, some of you younger generation or new converts, listen, it's the plan of God for every believer that's come to the knowledge of salvation to go from salvation to being filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with power. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3 and 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose words, who, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hmm. You hear me, church? The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the power that we need today. Like that elderly couple, so many in the church, they're floundering like fish out of water. Because here we are, earthly creatures, fleshly people, and we're trying to live a spiritual life. And we, we've been forgiven, praise the Lord. But without the power of the Holy Ghost dwelling in our hearts, everything we do is hard. That's why it's hard for some to come to church they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. It's why it's hard to turn the TV off. They're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. It's why it's hard to walk away from that addiction because you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why it's hard to live in victory because you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. We are like creatures living out of water. We're trying to live a spiritual life, but we're earthly creatures. But when the Holy Ghost comes, hallelujah, and I still remember when he baptized me in the Holy Ghost. I was 12 years old, living in Irving, Texas, and everything was different the next day. I can tell you that it's never been the same. And I will tell you today that when the Holy Spirit comes, when he descends upon you, when he fills you to the depth of your soul, hear me, everything will begin to change. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended upon the church. He empowered the church to do great things. And you can see the transition when you look through the book of Acts. And I'll tell you today, there's people who thought they were not worthy. There's people who thought it wasn't necessary. There's young people that have been afraid to open up to the power of the Holy Ghost. And there's churches that have refused to preach this message. But if there's anything we need today to face what we're going through, to face what might be in the future, we need the 
Holy Ghost. We need the power to fall upon us and baptize us so that we're full and overflowing. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? I've been praying for God to send a revival. God, why won't you send revival? Let the people, he said, they've got to first be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And there's people in this building. You may have been in church for years and you're good people. But God said, I've given the Holy Ghost to you to give you power. I'm going to try to close with this. The last few Wednesdays, it seems, I've, I've tried to touch on some things that deal with the flesh and the spirit. Galatians tells us they, they're opposing one another. They hate each other. The flesh will never take you towards God. And the spirit will never lead you in the wrong direction. I've tried to touch on the flesh and the spirit and how, even going back a few weeks, how the, the dog would climb the fence. Our flesh climbs that fence. And I've said something a few times that I want to repeat. The baptism, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, it's not natural. Not at all. It's not natural. It's supernatural. Mm. That's where most, a lot, a lot of us are stuck in the natural. So we naturally come to church and we like or don't like the music or we like or don't like the preaching or it's not long enough or it's way too long. Come on, somebody. We're stuck in the natural. We make decisions based off the natural. We're walking by sight instead of walking by faith. We give in. Is anybody here? We're walking in the natural. And we have this part of us that tries to obtain a spiritual thing from a fleshly point of view. Simply said, that's the truth. That's why there's no desire for revival. That's why prayer meetings are empty. That's why there's no desire for the word. The Holy Spirit is not natural. In other words, it's a supernatural experience. It's a supernatural experience that you have, that we have with God. It's an encounter. Come on, somebody. There's a difference between just showing up to his house this morning and having an encounter with God. The woman sick with 12 years with an issue of blood heard that Jesus was coming by. He would walk through her town. And if she had been some of us, she would have sat at the house. But she said, I've got to touch the hem of his garment. I've got to have an encounter with him. I want to experience him. And she made her way through the press. And she reached out a little trembling hand. And she touched the fringe edge of his garment. And virtue left his body. And he turned around and said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. It's a supernatural experience that you have. An encounter with God. And how many of you know it can happen right up here at this altar? Huh? When God supernaturally reaches down and touches your life. Hallelujah. I can recount many experiences that I've had in the altar when God would reach down and supernaturally touch me. It's, it's not a natural thing that we do. It's not a work that we perform. It's, it's not a list of rules that we adhere to. No, it is supernatural. Going back to the book of Acts chapter 2, let me read verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, how many of you know that act alone was supernatural? They were unified. They weren't divided. They were unified together in purpose and in mind. So that alone is a miracle. Because that doesn't happen naturally. 
I mean, I'll leave the pulpit today and somebody will come up and say, you were too loud. And I can walk three more feet and somebody will say, I couldn't hear you. And then I'll walk three more feet and they'll say, I was freezing to death. And then I'll walk three more feet and somebody says, I was dying of a heat stroke all through service. Do you understand unification? That's a work of the spirit when it comes down and brings us together in unity of mind and unity of purpose. Naturally, we are opposed. I don't know where that came from. Maybe somebody need to hear that. <laughs> Verse number two, and suddenly, everybody shout suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. I'm almost done. Calm down. Hang on. I mean, Donald Trump, 93 minutes the other night to accept his nomination. Don't call me long-winded. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Suddenly there was a sound. A sound. Say that out loud, a sound. Oh, I believe if there were unbelievers in that room, they didn't even hear it. Come on. There was a sound. And the believers that had gathered together in unity to wait on the promise of the Father, they heard something that the world didn't hear. And out of nowhere, they heard a sound from heaven. Is anybody hearing that? A sound, it wasn't natural. It wasn't the wind blowing outside. It wasn't the guy down the street with a trumpet. No, no, they heard a sound from heaven like a rushing and a mighty wind. It sounded like the wind was blowing and they looked out the windows and it was clear as day. There was no storm, but they could hear the wind rattling. I wanna tell you this morning in the supernatural, I believe the children of God can hear the wind of the spirit beginning to blow. Jesus is coming. This world is falling apart. And God's saying, I'm sending you the power of the Holy Ghost to give you help, to bring you out, to give you strength. Now, if you don't hear the sound and you've got to rush off to lunch, then you might want to talk to the Lord about what you're hearing. Because I can hear the wind beginning to blow. Oh, I can feel the touch of his spirit beginning to move. There is a rumbling in my spirit. And I believe God is just waiting for a church that will open their doors and say, God, have your way. I'm not worried about what they think. I'm not worried about what I have or what I don't have. I'm giving you permission to come in and blow, spirit, blow. Blow, blow into my heart. Blow into my family. Blow into my Sunday school class. Blow through the church with the mighty power of your spirit and change lives. And there appeared unto them, appeared, right? Can you imagine if I was up here just, well, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And I look out at Brother Ed and I, there's like a little ball of fire above his head. Now, nobody else would be able to, I mean, in the, in the natural, you couldn't see it. But what is that burning on top of Ed's head? He's already losing his hair. He's going to lose the rest of it. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. He got that of us. And it sat upon each of them. It wasn't natural. That was supernatural, honey. What was it? Cloven tongues of fire that sat upon them. Listen, and I can imagine looking out into that upper room and seeing little flames just burning over the top of their head. And the Bible said suddenly, all of a sudden, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And I will tell you, you might be in this building and you hear some of us say some things and you don't understand. I'm going to tell you, it's not another language. It's not from somewhere other in the world. It's not something I I'm making up, but that's the Holy Ghost inside of me that's praying. Is anybody hearing this? Cloven tongue, and they spoke with tongues. Yeah. Hallelujah. Everybody say supernatural. Here's my question. 
Are we willing to receive this power? Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? Are you willing? Are you ready? Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know. Maybe there's a theologian here. How far was it from where they were to Jerusalem? I don't know. But however far it was. Huh? Some, somebody say 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm joking. However far it was, they had the purpose in their heart. I'm going where he said to go. And maybe that was a 10-minute drive or a walk on, or ride on a camel. Maybe it was two days. I don't know. I, I didn't look that up. I'm sorry. But they made preparations for a trip, which would entail time away from the family. Maybe had to had to miss a day at work. I don't know. But they made an effort. They made a sacrifice. To go there. And then not just go, but then they had to wait. Come on, somebody. I had to stand in line at, at I think it was Taco Bell the other day for like eight minutes, and I thought I was going to lose my mind. <laughs> I was hungry. And people were ordering it. Oh, well, can I have, oh, never mind. Let's do this. And they started ordering. I was like, would you just order so I can have lunch? Anybody else get hangry? No, we want it right now, right? No, they, they made a trip, they sacrificed preparation, and then the Bible says they waited. They sacrificed, they, they made effort, they were willing to receive. And many times while they went to Jerusalem and while they waited, we're not willing to come to the altar or get in our prayer closet. We're not willing to be a little late to lunch. Not willing to lay on our face or let tears run down our cheeks and mess up your makeup if you're a woman. Come on, somebody. We're not willing. We're not willing. They were willing to go and wait. And God did not disappoint. I mean, you know, he will not disappoint. God is here today if he would come. And he's here to give you, everybody look at me just for a second. He's here to give you the power you need. That addiction that's got a hold of you, the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. He will break every yoke of bondage. You're struggling with the regrets of your past. I, I understand. But the Holy Ghost, pow, one supernatural moment with him. And the effects of it, they disappear. Amen. You're here today, and God's called you to do something. Everybody look at me. He's called you, well, it's just to maybe teach a little Sunday school class. Then God's here to give you the power Amen. to do that. Amen. Years ago, never mind. He's here today give you the power to succeed to give you the power you need to be that you need to be the mother that he called you to be to be the father the husband that you should be but will you take the time will you wait will you make the effort The Holy Spirit is a gift. I remember growing up, man, the preacher would make altar calls. Are y'all still with me? Like two more minutes. And they'd get up there and they'd hype up the crowd and whoo, whew, come on, come on down. And then the saints would go up and grab people by the chin and they'd start and they said, speak it out. And then another person over here is like, uh, hold on, let go. And they're just, listen, it's none of that. None of that. It's supernatural. You don't have to come down here and let me slap you on the head and you fall back. That, you, that might happen if it's the Holy Ghost. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to run around this altar. That might happen if it's the Holy Ghost, but you don't have to do that. 
It's a supernatural experience. Stand with me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, we bow our hearts before you today and we thank you for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Have your way. I'm trying to figure out. I, I, want, I want some Holy Ghost filled men and some Holy Ghost filled women. You're not going to answer the altar call because you're, you're full and overflowing. I kind of hesitate, but I, if that's you, then I want you to first, come, nobody looking, first you come up here so that you can help me pray. All right, you're full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to make a call for those that want to be baptized or have a fresh touch. But if you're here and you're full of the Holy Ghost, then come up here and help me pray. If you're here today, heads are bowed, eyes are closed while some are coming. You not being up here should be an admission that you need a touch from the Lord. It should be. It should help you to understand. I don't have the confidence to go up there and lay hands on people. So if that's you and you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost or you want a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, whether it's three of you or 30, if that's you, come up here and you can stand or you can find a place to kneel, front chairs, altars, steps, whatever you would like. But you not being up here should be a good reminder that you need a touch from the Lord. Come on, step out, step out, step out, step out. I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Everybody pay attention. I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost or I want a fresh touch of his spirit. Hallelujah. Teenagers, get up here in the altar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, don't wait for me to shake you by your head. But you let the Holy Spirit do something supernatural. That's all. That's all you have to do is have faith and believe and receive. You don't have to jump through a hoop. You don't have to give $10,000. You don't have to strive to be more worthy. All you got to do if you're a believer is receive. By faith, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. By faith, receive a fresh touch of His Spirit. Let Him empower you. Let Him lift you up. Let Him break the chains. Let Him shine the light in your darkness. In the name of Jesus. By faith, receive it right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Do the work. Do the work. Holy Ghost, you are welcome. You are welcome. Touch in the name of Jesus. Open up your mouth and begin to give God praise. Begin to give God praise. Let him bless you with that heavenly language. Hallelujah. Open up your mouth in faith and begin to speak. Let the infilling of the Holy Ghost seek.